Hola, buenos días a todos. Uh, no me voy a enrollar mucho porque, uh, por el interés del, del acto que tenemos ahora. Simplemente quería decir que estoy muy contento, a pesar de las fechas uh, especialmente malas, el 4 de septiembre. Bueno, hay un congreso en Polonia, hay gente que no está aquí porque está en Polonia, etc. Uh, estoy muy contento de, de que estemos aquí en, en este coloquio. Os agradezco mucho vuestra presencia. Uh, Hablo en castellano porque así nos se entiende, Carlos. ¿Eh? Uh, decir que este es el primer coloquio de la nueva serie de coloquios del CRM que pretendemos uh, como centro que queremos que sea de referencia en el ambiente de las matemáticas que esta nueva serie de coloquios también lo sea y hemos puesto gran ilusión en organizarlos y en elegir a uh, speakers uh, súper interesantes y súper pedagógicos y, y que seguro que, que nos van a motivar mucho. Y nada, daros las gracias. Simplemente yo lo, el mensaje que quería decir era este. Este es el primer coloquio de una nueva serie de coloquios del CRM y espero que después de este vendrán uh, muchos otros que serán igual de, de interesantes y de motivadores. Gracias por estar aquí y dejo la palabra a Xavier, que va a presentar al conferenciante. Gracias, gracias a todos. Hola, buen día. Um, I will speak in English, right? Because I think there may be some, I think there is somebody who doesn't speak Spanish. So, um, well, we should thank uh, Carmen Cascante, who is going to, who is going to take care of this uh, colloquium, right? And uh, it will be two uh, occasions, one or two occasions uh, every year, we will see. Uh, but these dates seem good, this first day, starting day, <laughs> from what I, some people said in the audience. So, okay, so let me talk a little about uh, Carlos. Um, well, as you know, he's an Argentinian mathematician in uh, partial differential equations and harmonic analysis. Um, he's a world referent and leader in, in PDEs and in harmonic analysis also. He's been professor at the University of Chicago since 1985. He did his PhD in Chicago also with Alberto Calderon, um, 1978. Then he was, um, he was professor or he, he He taught uh, in Princeton, Minnesota, and he came back to Chicago in 1985. Since then, he's, um, he's there in Chicago. <clears throat> he uh, has uh, several prizes and honors, of course. I would mention the Salem Prize in 1984 and the Bocker Memorial Prize 2008. And, um, well, he's member of the US National Academy of Science since 2014. And we were lucky that uh, he, uh, he was, was uh, kind enough to be president of the International Mathematical Union uh, in the last three years, 2019 to 2022. And to speak a little of, uh, well, I met him in 1994, I, I guess, 93, 94, in Princeton, one of his visits in Princeton when I was uh, working with Luis Caffarelli. And um, maybe he was there with work with Luis or maybe with the harmonic analysts in Princeton or with all of uh, Princeton University all, or all of them. Uh, well, as I told you, he's a leader in these uh, fields. He has more than 15,000 citations in MassiNet. And let me tell you a little of his specialities, uh, in, especially in, uh, in PDEs that I know, I know more. Uh, he, has, he started more in the elliptic and parabolic, uh, uh, for elliptic and parabolic equations. And here I would mention a very important work also in harmonic analysis on the generate elliptic equations and Mack and Haupt weights, right? For instance, the paper by Fabes, Kenick, Serapioni that I, I used many times, many of us used many times, and I saw that it's one of his most cited papers, of course, I saw this this morning. I would mention also all his works on uh, 
find very fine regularity properties for harmonic functions and other solutions of elliptic equations, uh, especially up to the boundary and the works in Lipschitz domains, right? So that started the, the, the fine regularity and um, properties in rough, in rough domains, starting with Lipschitz. He has a very important work with David Jerison from 1995. And I would mention also a very important uh, work in free boundary problems with Luis Caffarelli at uh, David Jerison uh, and himself on the Bernoulli or one phase free boundary problem. So that was the elliptic. And then, since he's so powerful, he changed to dispersive and wave uh, hyperbolic equations, okay? Which is the, the rest, the remaining pretty much, well, there would be fluids, okay? You didn't touch fluids or, well, I'm sure he touched fluid also. <laughs> but um, in the last years, he's been focusing more on dispersive. Uh, equations, uh, the KDB equation, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and more recently the nonlinear nonlinear wave equations. And there he worked many very important papers with Gustavo Ponce and Luis Vega from the 90s, and then uh, more recently with Frank Merle uh, from 2000, more or less, and um, and French collaborators. So in fact, he will speak. Uh, about harmonic analysis, I don't know. I should mention something else, uh, very important, perhaps. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure we can speak about that after the <laughs> after the talk. Um, so today he will speak about asymptotic simplification for nonlinear wave equations, um, and this is work with Fra Frank Merle and collaborators, as you will see, and this is a progress of more than 15, ye uh, 15 ye around 15 years. So thanks a lot, Luis. Muchas gracias por venir. Es uh, un placer. Uh, he was in Barcelona at the CRM giving a beautiful course in 2014 that I organized with Juan Soler, right? And there he spoke about the nonlinear wave already, or is Schrodinger? Both, nonlinear wave and nonlinear Schrodinger uh, equations, and that was a great mini course. So, gracias por venir de nuevo. <laughs> Well, first of all, let me thank uh, the CRM for this uh, great opportunity to be here, this very nice invitation. I also would like to thank particularly uh, Xavi Cabré and uh, Carmen Cascante for all their help in setting this up. Okay? So, uh, trying to make this uh, more accessible to a wider audience, I've is decided to start with a different kind of uh, simplification. And uh, so let me see. Okay. So I will start with uh, the work of Fourier. Okay. So uh, Fourier analysis and, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm doing this in in English because there's people here who don't speak Spanish. So, uh, Fourier analysis and partial differential equations have been intertwined since their beginnings in the work of Fourier. Fourier, by the way, was also uh, very involved in government. He was uh, Napoleon's viceroy in Egypt. Anyway, in his study of uh, heat conduction, Fourier de derived an equation, which is the heat equation, to describe the heat flow in a one-dimensional bar from Newton's law of cooling. So this equation is written right here, the time derivative of u minus twice the space derivative of u is zero. And u represents the temperature. So uh, Fourier then solved the initial value problem for the heat equation, okay? So wh what he did is, if you start with an initial temperature u naught, in a, let's say in an infinite bar to make things a little bit simpler, but let's make u naught to be zero near infinity so that we don't have to worry about convergence issues. 
uh, what Fourier did was calculate the temperature in the future at any point in the bar. In order to do this, Fourier made a claim that turned out to be uh, very controversial at the time. He claimed that if you give yourself any function u naught on the, on the line, let's say zero near infinity, it can be represented as an integral, which is a kind of sum, of trigonometric functions. So any u naught should be equal to this integral of e to the 2 pi i x, x c times c of c d x c. And he gave a recipe for calculating c of c. It's 1 over 2 pi, integral of e to the minus 2 pi i, x c, u0, x dx. And nowadays, we call c of c the Fourier transform of u0, u0 hat of c. Now, this claim was very controversial because the, the trigonometric functions, e to the 2 pi i, x c, are very nice functions. They're very good functions. So how can you represent a bad function as a sum of good functions? That was the, the objection. This it was at the time when people were first realizing that there are continuous functions that are not differentiable. So this was a, a quite controversial. So how can it be that bad functions can be represented as an integral of good functions? Now, uh, why did Fourier uh, introduce this uh, idea? The idea is that you can produce a simplification in solving the initial value problem for the heat equation by using this decomposition of the function u naught in terms of the Fourier transform. So to solve the initial value problem, all you need to do is solve for the special data, which is e to the 2 pi i x c. Because if you do that, then you just add them up and you get the general solution. Okay? So one obtains the general solution by integration. And now for, for this particular trigonometric functions, it's easy to write down the solution. It's e to the 2 pi i x c, e to the minus, e to the minus t, 4 pi squared psi squared. Okay? So now you've n solved the heat equation. Okay, so this was the, this uh, uh, simple but fundamental idea of Fourier. Now it turns out that Fourier's claim is actually false. And this is, uh, in fact, it is false for many functions and for many points x. But nevertheless, the method of Fourier worked, and it uh, is responsible for dramatic. Uh, uh, advances in technology in the 19th century. So let me give you some examples of what you could do using Fourier's method that people didn't know how to do before. First, you can calculate the temperature of the Earth. Of course, we're sitting on the surface of the Earth and we want to know the temperature inside. And for that, you can use the Fourier method to solve the heat equation. Okay. The next thing that you could do, and this was a, fundamental for trade in the 19th century, you can predict the tides. You can use uh, Fourier's method to predict the tides, and that for navigation in the 19th century for commerce was fundamental. Yeah. Marias. Okay. You, you need to know when the tide is coming. <laughs> okay, and uh, it was uh, Kelvin, actually, who, who, who did this application. Uh, the next thing was also something that Kelvin did. Uh, you can calculate what thickness you need to have in the transatlantic cable. So uh, you want to have, uh, let's say, telegraphic uh, communication between the UK and the United States. And so there was a company set up for this, and they built a cable, and they with a boat, they put the cable in the Atlantic, it went to the uh, bottom of the sea, and they tried to uh, do this telegraphic communication. And this failed. Okay. 
And so they consulted uh, with Kelvin, and Kelvin said, no, you got the wrong width in the cable. And he calculated using Fourier's method what the right width was, and then it worked. So anyway, uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know the numbers. Uh, so this, uh, I think, is a quite impressive uh, effect of a, a mathematical idea in day-to-day -day life. Right? And it's fantastic. Now, uh, for more mathematical uh, reasons, it turns out that this Fourier decomposition was also fundamental in the study and the development of linear partial differential equations in the 20th century. In the, in the 20th century, there was a big explosion in the uh, study of uh, linear partial differential equations. Uh, there are important names here, like uh, Hormander, uh, Schwartz, uh, Calderon, and uh, many others. And the, the theory was, uh, became very refined. But the basis for this theory was that you had the Fourier decomposition. Okay. But, of course, this can only work in linear problems. And uh, we all know, or at least we should know, that the world is not linear. It's nonlinear. So now I want to speak about a different simplification that takes place in a class of nonlinear differential equations. Okay? And this is the, the class of dispersive equations. Okay, and I'll explain a little bit first, where do the dispersive equations arise? So they model nonlinear wave uh, propagation, and there is also a simplification. But this time, the simplification is for very large time. It's asymptotic. Okay? I'll explain that in a few minutes. So the first thing I want to say about this class of dispersive equations, notice that for a while I will not write any equation. Okay. So uh, the class of dispersive equations, the first property that it has is that it's time reversible. You can go to the past or you can go to, uh, you can go to the future or to the past, and it doesn't make any difference. In the heat equation, you can only go forward in time. You can only go to the future. Uh, but nevertheless, nonlinear uh, linear dispersive equations can also be solved by the method of Fourier. So we, for the linear dispersive equations, we can use uh, the Fourier method. And uh, the other thing that, disper that uh, dispersive equations have is they have a conserved energy. Energy is not lost. It's preserved. But there are cases when the energy could be negative. And the energy need not have a sign. Okay? So that can be negative energy. We, we don't worry about this. I mean, uh, after all, okay, it may happen. So typically, this, uh, dispersive equations have a conserved energy, but it may or may not have a sign. Yes. That you can determine. Yes, you can find if I have a solution at time one, I can find it at time minus one. For example. Okay, and my clock also goes backward in time, but that's natural, right? That's future and that's past. Okay. Right. For the heat equation, you cannot do this. Right, uh, unless you have a very special function. Okay, so the, that's one uh, ideological difference, let's say. Okay, so, uh, but these equations, uh, these uh, nonlinear dispersive equations, I'll give you some examples of when they appear. They can appear in the study of shallow water waves. Okay, so you have a, a, a channel that's very shallow, and you want to understand how the waves propagate in this channel. That's a nonlinear dispersive equation. You want to use a pointer, a, a laser, 
that's also a nonlinear dispersive equation, and in general in nonlinear optics. Uh, you want to take into account nonlinear effects in elasticity theory. So nonlinear elasticity theory is also nonlinear dispersive equations. In particle physics, quantum physics, you need nonlinear dispersive equations. And there's also geometric flows that are uh, dispersive. And they arise, for instance, in color geometry or in Minkowski geometry. Okay. Now, th this uh, nonlinear dispersive equations have been studied extensively for the last 40 years. But they were first discovered. Oh, I'm sorry. but they were first discovered in the 19th century. Okay, so they do go back a very long way. And in my, to my mind, this is currently one of the most exact, uh, exciting areas of PDEs. Okay, so let me now put some formulas. I mean, not that I expect you to understand the formulas. I'm just putting some formulas so that you know that I'm not just waving my hands. There's formulas behind what I'm saying. So the first example is the, I'll call the generalized correct debris equation. And this describes the movement of water waves in a shallow channel. And uh, so they are DDTU minus third derivative in X in U. So that's the linear part plus a nonlinear term, which is U to the K times the X derivative of U. And we study the initial value problem, so we assign the data at time zero. Okay, and then we can go either to the future or to the past. So that's uh, one example. Another example uh, is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this uh, model, uh, nonlinear optics, lasers, ferromagnetism, quantum field theory, etc. I will refer, refer to the first ones as GKDV or KDV and the second ones as NLS. So NLS, the functions are complex value. And so NLS is I DDTU plus Laplacian U plus or minus U to the P minus one U equal to zero. Now X instead of just being on the line is on RN, T is in R and we assign the initial value U zero at time zero, okay? And P, will be a, any number bigger than one. So that this is a, that's the nonlinearity here. Then uh, come the nonlinear wave equations that arise in nonlinear elasticity, in some models in partic particle physics, and in some models of models in general relativity. So they're twice removed from general relativity, okay? And they are, uh, here you have a second derivative in time minus uh, the Laplacian, the space, spatial Laplacian. Again, we have plus or minus u to the p minus 1 times u. x is in Rn, t is in R. And u, here you have to assign two initial conditions because we have two time derivatives. So those of you who have taught ODE know that this is what you have to do. Then uh, you assign the value at time equal to zero and the time derivative at time equal to zero. And now there's a special P that I will concentrate on towards the end of the lecture, which is n plus two over n minus two, which is a very uh, important exponent, uh, both in the wave, Schrodinger, and in the elliptic case, and is the so-called energy critical exponent. And I will explain more why this arises later. Okay, but just remember that when uh, n equals three, u to the p minus one times u equals u to the fifth power. Okay. Uh, I'm, finally, let me just uh, uh, show you a geometric example, which is what uh, are called wave maps, which appear in, in particle physics in sigma models and then in uh, certain scenarios in general relativity. 
So here, instead of complex valued or real valued functions, we consider functions with values into a manifold. And the manifold will be just the round sphere, SN. Okay? Simple uh, manifold. And uh, the equation has uh, as the linear part the Dallin version, d squared tu minus Laplacian u. And then it has a nonlinear term, grad u squared in x minus d dt u squared times u equal to zero. But remember that u is a vector, it's, it's not a scalar. And it's a vector of length one. Okay, and then we take uh, the initial value at time zero and the time derivative at time zero. Now, why are these equations called dispersive? Uh, you know that uh, mathematicians are not very imaginative in their nomenclature. So these equations are dispersive because their linear parts are dispersive, okay? So now I have to tell you why is a linear equation dispersive. So uh, I'll tell you what it is heuristically. So heuristically, an equation, a linear evolution is dispersive when it spreads out the mass or the energy of the initial data. So it's all concentrated here, and as you evolve, it, it, gets pushed out, okay? So it disperses it. And now, usually dispersive equations have a conserved energy because they have a conserved energy. If the support gets to be larger and larger, the size has to become smaller and smaller to keep the balance that preserves the energy, okay? Yes but that's because of the inequality going in the right direction, the energy inequality, right? But this does it for forward and backward time, okay? Okay. So since the energy is conserved, the linear solution has to become small for large time. And this is known as the dispersive effect, okay? So if somebody, you hear somebody say something about the dispersive effect, now you know what, what it means, right? You're going like this, and then you have to go like that because the whole energy is preserved. Okay. This is for the future. Oh, for the past. For the, past. Pa the past and the future are the same. The past and the future are the same. So the energy is conserved going forward or backward. For, for a while, and then it'll start spreading out again. Okay? If I go faster, far, farther and faster. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, the interesting thing here is that in the nonlinear versions, there may be solutions that are not dispersive. They, they evolve in a non-dispersive fashion. So this is a purely linear dispersive effect. Okay, so we, I will. For example, in the nonlinear versions, there are solutions that are static. Okay, they don't move. So, of course, they cannot go down in size because they don't move. And there's also traveling waves. So, traveling waves are solutions that simply have the same shape for all times and they just uh, get translated in space for each time. Okay? So this existence, so these are nonlinear objects. We call these things nonlinear objects because they don't appear in linear theory. Okay? As I, can, as I said before, we're very simple-minded here. Okay. So, but the existence of these nonlinear objects has been a mystery since the 19th century. And there's a, a nice story of how they were first found. They were first found by John Scott Russell who was a Scottish engineer. John Scott Russell was uh, riding his horse in Scotland next to a canal, and he saw a wave that wasn't changing shape, and he followed it and followed it for miles and miles, and it never changed shape. Now, uh, John Scott Russell was not the kind of engineer we think of today. He was a very serious mathematician. 
And uh, John Scott Russell actually built the biggest steam boat from the middle, which was the biggest one from the middle of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. So this guy was something serious. Okay? But he's, he observed the solitons. So he reported this to the Royal Society. I mean, he was a member of the Royal Society. He reported this, and then uh, he was booed. He, you know, people were completely skeptic, especially Airy and Stokes, who were uh, leading uh, experts on water waves, because their linear water wave theories did not permit the existence of such objects. So they thought that this was garbage. Okay. But then uh, Boussinesc and, uh, in France and Rayleigh in, the, in Britain, they put forward nonlinear theories to explain Russell's observations. And finally, the, the definitive equation was found at the end of the 19th century by Corbeck and his student De Vries. And they formulated the Corbeck De Vries equations, the KDV, which is the a case of k equals to 1 of what we had before. But their fundamental properties were not understood until uh, much later. OK. So in the late 70s and 80s, the, uh, 1895. OK. Uh, the end of the 19th century. So in the late 70s and 80s, many properties of nonlinear dispersive equations were discovered. Notably, the existence and stability, mostly conditionally, of traveling waves. Now, in the late 80s and 90s, with Ponce and Vega, we introduced a systematic use of the machinery of mo modern Fourier analysis to study the linear dispersive equations, and then use the linear properties uh, perturbatively to deduce properties of the nonlinear equations. So this built a, a huge body of uh, techniques which were extremely effective. And then there were uh, refinements uh, and extensions by Bourguin, Tao, Tataru, Kleineron, Macedon, and many others. And this proved to be e extremely powerful. And satisfactory theories were obtained for the well-posedness of the problems for short time. Because you can expect that for short time, the linear equations are good approximations to the nonlinear ones. And if you have very small data, you can expect that the linear solutions will approximate the nonlinear solutions for all time. Okay? And that's what we did. And uh, uh, what is uh, another important thing that emerged at this time was a notion of criticality, which is linked to scaling. And I'll explain that later on. Okay? But now there's a notion of critically, critical problems. Now, in the last 20 years, there's been a, a shift in emphasis from the study of things in the small to study of things in the large. Okay? So we now want to understand the long time behavior of large solutions. Okay? So then issues like blow up, maybe your solution will cease to exist for some reason, or global existence, and scattering. I'll explain what scattering is later on. But basically, scatter, a solution scatters if for a very large time it looks like a linear solution. Okay, this is the the concept of scattering. And uh, this in, especially in critical problems. So this uh, study was uh, transformed by work uh, that I did with Frank Merrill in the period 2005-2009, where we introduced what we call the concentration compactness rigidity theorem method. And this was the subject of my course in Barcelona in 2014. And uh, this is the standard approach to this kind of problem right now. But the, the ultimate goal that we had when we introduced this, this method 
was to attack the problem of asymptotic soliton resolution. So let me explain what that is. So since the 1970s, there's been a, a widely held belief in the math physics community that things called coherent structures and free radiation describe the long time asymptotics of solutions to nonlinear dispersive equations. And this belief, notice that I'm being careful with my terminology here, it's a belief, this belief came to be known as the soliton resolution conjecture. So the soliton resolution conjecture is not a mathematical conjecture, it's a more a philosophical conjecture. Okay? So roughly speaking, this means that asymptotically in time, for dispersive equations, if you wait long enough, there will be a simplification. And the simplification that will emerge is that you will have, whatever uh, the initial data is, you will have a sum of solitary waves, okay? Traveling waves, or solitons if you, if you want to call them that, like that, and a radiation term. And the radiation term will be the dispersive part, will be a solution to an also associated uh, linear evolution, linear dispersive equation. Okay? So this is, you know, uh, sounds crazy. Why should uh, something extremely complicated become so simple? Okay? So in my opinion, it's a remarkable claim, and it's a beautiful claim. And uh, let me explain what the origin of this conjecture. Uh, this is a, a quite an interesting story at this point. The origin of this conjecture was the birth of scientific computation. So let me go back to this. It goes back to a puzzling numerical simulation done by Fermi Pasta Nulan at Los Alamos at the end of World War II. And so, it was a late 40s, early 50s. And this was literally the birth of scientific computation. Uh, what Fermi decided to do after the war was over was to use the, the computer that they had used for the calculations to build the atomic bomb for a scientific purpose. He wanted to find some theoretical scientific purpose which you could use this machine for. And so he decided to do a simulation of a PD. And that was the first numerical simulation of a PD. Okay? So he proposed a numerical experiment. The machine was called the Maniac, yes. Of course, they trusted it to a certain extent, even though he was a maniac. But uh, anyway, uh, everybody in Fermi's uh, group died early from cancer. Every single person. Died from cancer? Yeah, early, at early ages. Fermi himself died soon after. Los Alamos is still contaminated. <laughs> it's still contaminated in certain areas, right? Okay. The basement of Eckhart Hall, which is the uh, Department of Mathematics at, at Chicago, it was the physics and math department in those days, had to be cleaned from radiation. Okay. Because that's where uh, Fermi's group did the first uh, chain reaction was not the first chain reaction was done under the football field, but the beginnings of this ch chain reactions were done uh, in the basement of Eckert Hall. Okay. So don't be afraid, no radiation uh, <laughs> is in this machine. So uh, what he wanted to do, Fermi is verify something called the principle of thermalization. So what they considered was a vibrating string, but with a nonlinear term. And the nonlinear term was quadratic. And uh, to be able to uh, model it, they used this discretization, 
on a lattice on the line. Okay, the normal thing is normal for us now, but it hasn't been done before. Okay, so anyway, so this is what they did. There was a fourth uh, member of the team. Uh, her name was, uh, is Mary Tsingu. Uh, she was the person who actually did the programming. Tsingu. T-S-I-N-G-O-U. She's still alive. She's in her 90s. And uh, they didn't put her name on the paper. Okay. So uh, there are two types of theories here. I will come back to that. Uh, to this. There's the first uh, uh, obvious uh, reaction, which is, of course, she was a woman, so she, her name shouldn't be on the paper. There's another reaction with, so she is a computer scientist, so her calculations are just like nothing. They shouldn't be put on the paper. Okay. And I'll explain why there's some uh, evidence for the second part later on. By the way, uh, if you look for Mary Singer's publications after that, you won't find any. And the reason was that she got married. And then her uh, next publications were all done in her husband's, uh, with her husband's last name. Okay? All right. So, hope I'm entertaining somewhat. Okay. So, let me explain what thermalization is. The principle of thermalization... Oops. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. What happens is my screen goes dark and then I... Anyway, thermal thermalization means that if you consider data, all of whose energy is concentrated around one mode, okay, one Fourier mode, then instantaneously the evolution should equidistribute the energy. Okay, that's the principle of thermalization. You have energy all around a point, you start the evolution, and then it should spread out. Okay, that's what uh, Fermi expected to see. But the simulation showed that this did not happen. Even in instantaneous, uh, yeah, even in long time it did not happen. It also did not happen. But they, they were wondering, is it instantaneous, is it, is it after a while? And none of this happened. Apparently they left the the computer going for too long one day, they forgot about it, and they had a very long simulation, and they saw that it won't. No. Okay. So Fermi died uh, soon after, and this, uh, he called this a minor discovery. <laughs> he discovered scientific computation and uh, the fact that thermalization fails, but for him this was a minor discovery. And, uh, Anyway, so this is what Ulam says in his uh, autobiography. And uh, this remained a mystery for a decade and a half. And finally, uh, Martin Kruskal made uh, a following observation. If you look at the mesh in the lattice where you did the uh, discretization of the problem, 10 to 0, you can make this vibrating string with a quadratic nonlinearity converge to the correct Debris equation. Okay, he, how he guessed this, I don't know, but he guessed it. Uh, and then once you have the correct Debris equation, the correct Debris equation has traveling wave solutions. And if you have a traveling wave solution, the uh, size of the, each mode is constant. So you cannot have a thermalization. And so that's the end of the Fermi Pasta Ulam paradox. Okay? Okay, so KDV then came into this picture. So it turns out that what uh, Russell had discovered on his horse was what answered the question of thermalization, Fermi's minor discovery. Okay? So soon after, Kruskal and Zabuski did another numerical simulation, this time on KDV, and they discovered two uh, remarkable things. First, that uh, for simple data concentrated on one mode, the evolution for large time 
equals uh, in colons because it's numerical, and it's numerical, a sum of traveling waves. So that's the first observation. The second observation was that if you start with your data being two traveling waves at different speeds, and you evolve, then they will collide. Okay? That traveling at different speeds, eventually they'll collide. What happens after they collide? And their observation was that after they collide, they re-emerge unscathed. They don't change. They're just translated in space. Exactly, as if it was linear, but it is non-linear. Okay? So this was the, the uh, kruskal zabuski experiment. So let me just refer to the previous experiment. Uh, here there was also a computer scientist who did the actual computation. The computer scientist was a man, and his name also disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this is just uh, food for thought. Okay? Okay, so uh, part A clearly gives rise to the soliton resolution conjecture because they start out with something and then they see it evolving as a sum of solitons. And B eventually was discovered to be a consequence of a, a new concept in nonlinear science called integrability. So uh, integrable nonlinear equations can be reduced to a collection of linear problems. And uh, this is a, a very uh, important notion in nonlinear science because it turns out that uh, many important equations are, not, are integrable, but it's a non-generic concept. If you perturb a little bit an integrable equation, you lose integrability. It gets destroyed. So it's not stable under perturbations of any kind. So, uh, so for example, for the family of KDV equations, remember there's a parameter K in the power U to the K. The case K equals one is integrable. The case K equals two is integrable. And none of the others is integrable. For the case of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, remember there was a U to the P, okay? and there's n dimensions. Only the case of one dimension p equals three is integral. No other one is integral. Okay. So the soliton resolution then uh, was proved in a few integral cases where you have this connection with linear problems at hand. Uh, and in, case, in the case of k equals one and two, in generalized KDV, KDV, and in the case of P equals three, N equals one in NLS, so this were the only in integrable cases. But even in these cases, the, the proofs were challenging, and there are, believe it or not, still issues unresolved, okay? Even for the completely integrable case of KDV, K equals to one. There are regions in space-time where we don't know if soliton resolution holds or not. There have also been many, many perturbative regimes, uh, results in perturbative regimes, some of them non-integrable. Uh, so if you are near a soliton, can you then say that you persist being near a soliton? But the, the quest for establishing soliton resolution in the large for non-integrable models, which are time reversible and Hamiltonian, so have conserved energies, has been a grand challenge in PDE for the last uh, 50 years. It remained open despite uh, many attempts. I'll just mention one that uh, was uh, very noticeable, done by Tao in the early 2000s for NLS in very high dimensions, but it all only yielded very, very partial results. So eventually the impasse was uh, broken in work uh, with Duikaya and Merrill in 2013 for the case of the three-dimensional radial energy critical wave equation, 
And this was the first such result for non-integrable Hamiltonian PDEs. Okay? So, uh, what, was the, what is the mechanism that one can see why there should be soliton resolution? And this, uh, so the, the, the coherent structures are basically a sum of modulated traveling waves. That's what that means. And the radiation term is just a solution of a linear equation. Okay? So the mechanism that you observe both numerically and experimentally in many diverse settings, for example, the dynamics of gas bubbles in a compressible fluid and in the formation of black holes and gravitational collapse, that you don't observe in the lab, right? You do a, a numerical simulation. But the other ones you do observe in the lab. Okay? What happens is that uh, the excess radiation is pushed out to spatial infinity. And each time you push out a certain amount, you get a new solid in the decomposition. Of course, this is no math. I mean, this is uh, what you see in either the lab or, or in a computer. I mean, so the question is how to prove this. And uh, with uh, Ducari and Merle, we found a mathematical way to quantify this. So now let's go to a more precise uh, formulation of this. We are in, uh, let's say, R3 or Rn. This is the wave equation and I'm choosing a particular power here. In th dimension three, it's e to the fifth. In other dimensions, it's what I write here. And the, we have to assign spaces for the initial uh, data. U0 has a, uh, the functions with a gradient in L2. It's a very natural space here. And uh, you, the time derivative is just an L2 function. So uh, this equation we call focusing. Why is that? Because the, the Laplacian is a negative operator. Okay? Because if you take Laplacian f times f, you integrate that, you integrate by parts, you get minus the gradient of f squared. That's a negative one. So the Laplacian is a negative operator. And uh, u to the fifth, so, but here it's minus, so it's a positive operator. And here you have u to the fifth with a plus sign in front. And so that's also positive. And so the nonlinear effects and the linear effects fight each other. And that's why we call this focusing. And I'll explain more about this later on. Uh, they have the same strength in terms of scaling, as I will explain in a minute. So the nonlinear and linear terms have the same strength, but opposite signs, and so they fight each other. Let me explain why we call this energy critical. And it's critical for the scaling because if you start, let lambda be bigger than zero, suppose u is a solution, I scale space and time the same way, but then I add a, a lambda factor that's well chosen, and in n dimensions it would be this, then this is also a solution. And it's the only uh, scaling that's allowed to keep the solution. And the energy space, H1 cross L2, remains invariant under this scaling. I cannot make the initial data small by moving the parameter lambda. It's fixed. Okay. And that's why we call this critical for the scaling. Okay. Now this equation has a conserved energy. It's 1 half grad u naught squared plus 1 half u1 squared plus one six u naught to the six. Minus. Minus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And here is minus n minus two over two n. Now this equation again has solutions that do not disperse. Okay. Because they're static solutions. They're solutions q to the corresponding elliptic equation, which are in the space H1 and are not zero. And this is the equation that appears in the Yamawa problem in, in differential geometry. And this is why these equations were studied extensively in the 1980s and early 90s. Okay. Yeah. 
the elliptic equation. Yeah. Now, there is an, a, a, an object that we call the ground state, which is the explicit solution with least energy, this W of x. It's given by this formula. Okay. And this was known to the elliptic community. It was crucial in the solution of the Yamada problem. Okay. Now, what is interesting is that up to sign and scaling is the unique solution of least energy. And this is a result of Gidas Nierenberg, Gidas uh, Caffarelli, Gidas and Sprock. Okay. So it was an important result, but it's known. There are also traveling wave solutions to this nonlinear wave equation because the Lorentzian group acts on the space of solutions. So you have a, a, another group which acts on space-time that leaves invariant the space of solutions. So what you can do is you take a static solution, that is to say a solution to the elliptic equation, and you uh, do its Lorentz transformation. And what you get is a traveling wave solution. And they travel all at speeds less than one. Because in this model, the speed of light is one. OK? Because the constant in front of the Laplacian is one. So the speed of light is one. OK? So if you take any non-zero static solution, you perform the uh, Lorentz transformation, you get a traveling wave solution. And here is the formula of its uh, value at time zero when L is just goes in one direction in R3. If I write this, the formulas in higher D, they look horrible. But anyway, one can understand. And uh, the first fact here, uh, which we proved with Ducaire and Merrill in 2014, uh, that these are all the traveling wave solutions. There are no other traveling wave solutions. So we've accounted for them all. Now, in the case when you restrict to radial solutions, there are no traveling wave solutions. There are only static solutions. And they are the rescalings of this specific W with a plus or a minus sign. Okay? So let me explain this theorem of soliton resolution for the 3D wave equation, energy critical. Okay? So we take a radial solution, n equals to 3, exists for all time. Then there is a number, j, natural number, or 0, a radial solution of the linear wave equation, the radiation term. There are scaling parameters, lambda j. There are signs, i, j. The scaling parameters are such that the ratio of any two consecutive ones goes to 0 as you approach the infinite time. And they're all uh, subluminal. Okay? Sub, yeah, subluminal. Ah. <laughs> okay? Subluminal. Yeah, not, not subliminal, but subluminal. Yeah, because one is the speed of light. Of waves, so yeah, yeah. Light. Yeah. Okay? And such that, okay, our solution is the sum of the rescaled traveling waves, I mean, static solutions with a sign plus the radiation term, plus an error that goes to zero in the energy space. These Ws don't depend on time, so the time derivative is just the radiation term, plus something that goes to zero in L2. As t goes to infinity. Yeah, as t goes to infinity. So plus minus infinity. You could do it at minus infinity also, right? But then you need to assume that it exists for all time. Yeah. So huh. any solution? Any solution? That exists for all time, a radial solution. That exists for all time. So, but, uh, yeah. So, this is the first uh, non integrable soliton resolution. Okay. This is the theorem. The, the resolution for forward time for plus infinity and plus infinity are uh, the same. Uh, uh, they need not be the, the, they need not be the same. The, the number of uh, blocks is the same. But then uh, the scaling parameters are, could be different. Okay. 
the number of blocks has to be the same for energy considerations. OK. okay. So let me just explain the key fact in the proof. And it's what we call the energy channel. Suppose U is a radial solution of the nonlinear wave equation in dimension 3 for x bigger than r plus absolute value of t. So it's on the outside of a fattened light cone. And uh, suppose that we assume that U is non-zero and it's not one of the traveling, it's not one of the rescaled solitons. Okay? Then, no matter what r is, we can find an eta such that either for all positive times or for all negative times, there's always a residual energy outside this fattened light cone. So this is what quantifies the fact that you're pushing energy to a spatial infinity. There's always some energy left there. Okay? But this is math, it's, it's not a, an experiment. I mean, So, how much longer do you, maybe 10, 15 minutes? 10, 15 minutes is okay? Okay, okay, I'll try. Okay, so this is a, a, of course we were very happy with this result, this is a very nice result, but in a way it, it was too good. It spoiled us. We, said, so, okay, so now we can do this in all dimensions, why, why n equals to three. So we tried and we tried and we tried. We couldn't do it. We tried to prove this key fact in higher dimensions. This is what made the thing work, and we couldn't do it. And uh, it's a good thing that we couldn't do it. Yes. What about passing, I mean, how, how do you feel with the radial uh, assumption? Okay, so that uh, we will... We will come later, okay, sorry. but also later than today. <laughs> later than today. <laughs> okay, I will. But you will say something. Yes, I will certainly say something today. Okay. But we were. We said at least in the radial case we should be able. Radial, maybe we could say that it means radial symmetric. With space, yeah, yeah, space. radially symmetric in space. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but it turns out, to our great surprise, that with uh, Jacques Collot and Duicaire and Merle, just last year, we found out that this statement is false in higher dimensions, in dimensions five and higher. Okay? <laughs> it's just false. In fact, we we were able to classify all the solutions that fail to have this property. Okay, so we have a dictionary of what all of them are. Okay? But it does work for n equals to 3 and also for n equals to 4, which is a, a, a critical case. Now we proved this, the, K, the n equals to 4 case, during the pandemic. And this was a, quite an experience. To, I was actually, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was very sick. I got COVID uh, at the very beginning. And uh, I, it took me actually a long time to recover. But after that, we could prove this thing <laughs> in dimension four. So that was, but it was, uh, of course, done over the telephone because Frank didn't use Zoom, but the others, we used Zoom. <laughs> Not at that time, later he learned. So, but for many years, you know, it was almost 10 years, we, we were stuck not knowing what to do. So we took a different approach. And let me tell you a little bit about the different approach. So the, uh, the different approach is that instead of trying to prove the decomposition for all times, we could try to prove it for well-chosen sequences of time. So if you give me a solution, maybe I can find a very well-chosen sequence of times such that I can do the decomposition for that sequence. And in fact, things like this had been known 
in geometric uh, flows of parabolic type, for instance, in work of Topping and Etienne. So uh, we decided to try that. And uh, using that idea and some monotonicity after time averaging, we were able to uh, prove the decomposition in all, oh, I'm sorry, for all radial cases. Uh, the first uh, case for odd dimensions was done by my student Casey Rodriguez in 2014, and then the even dimensions I did with my then postdoc Howard Jia in 2015. Now, a similar result was then proved in the non-radial case. So this is what I'm going to say in the non-radial case. And uh, this is a joint work with Ducaire, uh, Gia, and Merle from 2017, which says that if U is a non-radial solution of a nonlinear wave equation, then we can find the number of solitary waves, a solution of a linear equation, and a well-chosen sequence of times going to plus infinity, such that, oh, and for each little j, a non-zero solution of the elliptic equation, and a Lorentz direction, Lj, such that the solution decomposes for these times as the traveling wave solutions plus the radiation term plus a term that goes to zero in the energy space. And for the time derivatives, now we have to do the time derivative because these are traveling waves. So. And uh, the parameters are such that uh, each bubble doesn't see the others, either by scaling or by uh, separation of the centers. Okay. So this is what we know so far in the non-radial case. In fact, we know some more, but I'm not at liberty to discuss. I mean, it's a general case. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, but uh, I want to say a few remarks. A method of proof relying on monotonicity after time average cannot give more than a decomposition for a well-chosen sequences of times. And here we have a, an example due to topping for the harmonic map heat flow into a C infinity manifold, which is not the sphere, for which the decomposition is different for different sequences of times. Okay? But it is expected that, for instance, for the wave maps, you will have the decomposition for all times when the target is the sphere. Okay? But this is uh, still in early stages. Okay. So the main challenge to try to prove the decomposition, even in the radial case, for, uh, for all times as opposed to from well-chosen sequences of times, is that we need to prove that when two or more uh, traveling waves collide, or two static solutions that have uh, different scalings collide, in the non-integrable case, as opposed to the integrable case analyzed by uh, uh, Kruskal and Zabuski, there is always radiation. So the collision is not elastic, it's inelastic. So this is what one needs to prove to prove that the decomposition holds for all times. Okay, and uh, recently we have succeeded to doing, in doing this for the radial case in all dimensions. So I'll conclude, okay. I'll conclude with that. So the analog of theorem one is now true for all radial solutions, all n bigger than or equal to three. And uh, for uh, the odd dimensions we did with Ducair and Merrill uh, right before the pandemic, for dimension four we did with uh, Ducair, Martel, and Merrill during the pandemic, and then after the pandemic, we did the case of dimension six with Collot, Ducaire, and Merle, and this is where we finally discovered that this uh, uh, channel of energy had to be modified. There is a modification that makes it work, but as it was, it was false. And we uh, found a dictionary.
for all of them. And then uh, soon after that, uh, Gendridge and Laurie found uh, another proof, also studying collisions of solitons, that works for all n bigger than or equal to 4 in late 2022. So now we have the complete story. So the thing to do next is to do wave maps in uh, not uh, uh, without symmetry and do nonlinear wave equation without symmetry. Hopefully it will not take another 15 years. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's more or less on time, right? Uh, in, the, in the experiment by Kruskal and Zabuski, the, the, the collision, um, it is based on the fact that larger solitons, they move uh, quicker, yeah. and the larger one catches the other one. If, yes. And uh, th this fact, the fact that the speed depends on the size of the soliton, how is interpreted? How is seen in this? Uh, uh, well, you can see it directly in, uh, in uh, the integrable case by using the inverse scattering transform. Okay. And so there, the multi solitons are uh, compu uh, computed exactly, and you have a formula for them. And you can see this from this formula. This is not a precise mathematical question, but a philosophical one. Eh? I mean, I, I don't quite see the analogy with the, the Fourier method that you started with. I mean, uh, uh, you said that you presented as if we were going to see something parallel to Fourier's method. No, no. <laughs> no, this was just an introduction. An introduction. I, I mean, to, to, is... to show that uh, simplification is an old concept. So there is no, no, no essential ways that Surfaces to be analyzed. Uh, no, so uh, what I have to say is that there's a, an underlying small data theory to an small data theory or uh, existence for a short time for large data theory. And that is all Fourier method. So we have to get started by the Fourier method. And then you see how far you can go. I have a small question about the form of uh, slide 33. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we have a form, discrete form for the, the integral, so we can implement it somehow with computer or? Slide 33. Slide 33. Slide 33. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're very precise, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, here we have an integral form, so I'm not sure if we have a discrete form so we can uh, have some implementation using computer for the formula that we have here. Yes. It's a, it's a space integral for each fixed time. Yeah. Can, can we have a discrete form somehow? Could we have a what? Dis discrete form. So, for example, in integral, somehow we can't implement this integration. So it's the, the standard uh, Lebesgue integral of the, oh, okay. the gradient squared of dx. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question or comment? Yes. Marcel. So, these are results 
but for this concrete exponent, which is critical, right? So yes. is there anything known about the long-term dyna dynamic if you change to, say, subcritical? No, or so uh, I think the subcritical, uh, the, first of all, this is an excellent question. The subcritical case is more difficult. Any of them, yeah. Any of them. So uh, the subcritical case is uh, much harder. And the reason for that is that uh, there are nonlinear objects that are not solitons. Okay? And because of that, uh, the theorem should be that the decomposition holds just generic for generic data instead of for all data. And uh, we struggled with that. So this is something uh, I imagine for future generations. So what is, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, so what does this number of terms in the decomposition depend on? Like, is it some sort of complexity of the equation that we? So you have this capital J. Yes, the J depends on the energy of the data. So I can compute how many yes. sums can be there. Yeah. You know the J just from knowing the energy. You right. If two solutions have the same energy, if two initial data have the same energy, then they have, they the, have same the same J. They have the same J. I see. Any other question or comment? If not, I have one about the, the last slide, say. So the last slide is for general solutions, for non-radial, right? No, the last slide is for radial. Ah, the last, the last, the last, yeah, the last one, the last theorem is for radial, radial. but then not, not for a sequence of times, but for all times, the, for all time, which is the, the, yeah. what you wish. Okay. And, but before, before, uh, you had first a result for radial and then a, a one for non-radial and then one for non-radial. Yes. But it's for a well-chosen sequence of times. But this for well-chosen, but usually Passing from radial to non-radial is very difficult, right? Yes. So? And so here too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now you cannot pass to non-radial? Not in, yet. In the last, not yet. Okay, in the last year. Okay. We, we, we <laughs> hope so, but not yet. And, and can you say a word about this passing from radial to non-radial? Or to... Uh, one thing that is a severe uh, obstruction is that... No, in the, in the positive, when you did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Oh. Now, I said this thing is false in certain dimensions. That's the case. But there are other versions of it that are true. In the non-radial case, there isn't any other version that is true. Because somehow, whenever you write one, you find counterexamples according to the spherical harmonic decomposition of the data. For each degree of spherical harmonic, something different happens. And so it becomes uh, quite tricky to... But I, I think that at least in, the, in some important cases, we should be able to do that. But the proof in the non-radial case, it follows the ideas of the radial case, or...? It, it follows the idea of uh, using time, and this, this uh, theorem that you asked for. It uses the monotonicity after time averages. But you don't use the radial result to get the non-radial? No. 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 But the techniques, yes. yes. If there is no other question, let's thank uh, Carlos again for the beautiful for the beautiful colloquia. Yeah.